This is Ganyale, the place that I previously did a video on where I encountered individual that had told me all about an MK Ultra program running throughout the alternative communities and that it had been doing so for many years and there were many males involved in doing that. And he had also told me that by this stage that all the communities had been infiltrated and that their job was to go in there and basically observe them, um, report back what was going on and uh, they would only stay there for a, a period of two years as I explained in the previous video but I'm just trying to give a summary here of pretty much what it took me an hour to explain what I should have said in five minutes but you wouldn't have understood if I did. So there was the um, person that I encountered at Ganyawe that was called Alan Hamer. He called himself the Jester and he was the one that told me all this. And he told me about Frank the Birdman who I also knew and other people I didn't know who was Chris and Brett the spider and Paul who was the trainer uh, a psychic remote viewer that would take them and when I say them because he wasn't the only one as he was telling me there were all these others um, that would take them back in for their two weeks uh, eight weeks training every two years because the programming that they've I suppose, as I explained in the other video, it's probably because of the old techniques that were used on, on them years ago. These are MK Ultra, not the Super Soldier MK Ultra, but the older version, I suppose, where the younger version, they tweaked out things and so that the programming wouldn't break down as much and that the personas that they were carrying on with were more entrenched as a reality with this person so that they couldn't break through and actually start to get confused because you know I, I, this is where a lot of them would end up in a mental institution claiming split personalities because that's essentially what has happened that the full main ultra personality is is breaking down and allowing other personalities maybe even the real personality to come through but you don't know which personality is going to come through once it starts breaking down now these people um, have a certain level of um, all right I'm not going to go any further in that area because yesterday uh, well the last video I did on it I realized that I was talking about the experience that I had here at Ganyawe and the individual that I encountered all those years, well, six years ago, and the individual that I encountered recently, that everything that I've seen, even the, the connection that this person is also connected to Byron Bay. Now, at this community at Ganyawe, and there used to be other people that would drop in every day from all over different places. There were um, people from other communities, uh, friends that they knew that weren't from communities but they just had in the area or somewhere else. And uh, also on the odd occasion you would have woofers come in. Now I'll explain woofers in a minute because I don't want to get off the subject here. I've already forgotten what I was talking about. That's right, I was getting at the the confusion I might have created in my previous video because I didn't clearly distinguish between the person that had made me remember this experience because of all the, the boxes they ticked. And it wasn't just... Uh, I mean, Byron Bay on its own, I mean, it's a strange place in, in this larger northern New South Wales region that it, there are people that there's always something that seems to be going on at Byron Bay and I never went there because I went there years ago and it's like many other places with shrubby 
bush and sand and there's not much there. It's just, I really didn't see what people found appealing about it. I know that it, uh, in summer that it swells out with lots of beach goers and stuff like that, but then lots of places do. So, and that's not appealing to me to have it swell out with lots of people. I'm more your, your recluse rather than your party crowd goer. So there's this connection to Byron Bay and there's also the connection to Byron Bay of the, the celebrities. I mean, uh, they love to buy land as their Australia retreat, you know. Um, yeah, it, there's, there's just some sort of connection about Byron Bay to all of these communities that I just don't understand, never got, but it was also because of that that it's when I hear someone say that they were in Byron Bay and that they've lived a particular lifestyle, they've done certain things, and then when I've observed enough of their conversation and their reactions to when people challenge them too. I mean, this individual that I'm talking about that I encountered recently, um, he is a very good presenter if he speaks on his own. And I agree with so much of what he's saying. But if you put him in an environment where he is with other people, he tends to dominate the conversation and he doesn't like to be challenged on what he's saying. And he will make an argument over what I do consider very petty things. Now, if I actually brought this out to that person, I've seen um, it happen enough times from... I've looked all through YouTube and other places I've found YouTube um, videos and I've seen at least three instances where he's had falling out with people and they've had him unleash a torrent of um, anger about how he feels about them and he accuses them of all these things and says he will you know, gladly debated or, oh no, they're not worth it, I've long written them off, they're not even worth debating it. But this is the form of, you know, retort he has back to something. It's not a debate, it's not a conversation, it's an attack. And that attack is a defence mechanism that I also believe is when people say something uh, there's a certain amount of explanation you can put into something before it gets to the point and it's not something you'll you'll be deliberately paying attention to but all of a sudden you'll think you know what I think thou does protest too much it's like you're trying to convince me of something too much and that's when I get the feeling that this person um, you see, when people have behaviours that they don't want to admit and they become defensive and attack, they put it back onto other people and make it about how they don't need to justify everything to them. Uh, look, I'm not going to get into psychoanalysis here because... Um, I've always observed human behaviour, not because I set out to, but because, as I say, that if you observe something for long enough and you meet people, see them for long enough, and you listen to them, uh, you, you don't even realise it one day, but something they say might uh, trigger something in you. It might be good or bad. It might make you feel good or it might bother you. Now, the things that bother me, I ask, well, why does that bother me? And then I look a little bit further into it. And see, this person right now that I'm talking about in the present, let's just give him a name of Morgan. I'm going to give him a pseudonym on his pseudonym by a person that didn't like their first name either, Ian Morgan. He's deceased now. He was a friend of my mum's and he was always known as Morgan. So I'm going to call this guy Morgan. So
This Morgan guy has been associated with the alternative lifestyle community not only here in Australia but worldwide and over the years he's made connections and he's uh, become part of a larger group of alternative thinkers so that if there's something that wants to be achieved that he's going to be a natural person to go to to bring in because they know that that person has connection to a large audience and it's in that that why I'm really saying something about all of this right now because there is a global movement going on that is trying to coordinate people to come out into their own power but if we have um, people telling the government when and where we're going to be stopped so if you have someone that's inside your camp that you trust and knows all this information and is reporting it back no matter what effort you take if you're not stopped you'll be set up for something they'll be waiting for you so if you're not stopped and it's allowed to go ahead there's a reason it will be allowed to go ahead and that will have consequences I mean we know that uh, the protests were allowed to go ahead so that they could be used to justify other conditions and that's because there are infiltrators inside these not only alternative lifestyle communities but in the alternative news media it is heavily saturated with controlled narratives and most of the people that are predominant in these areas are controlled narratives and some of them don't know it but a lot of them you've actually seen that they've had at least one meltdown I could mention at least three of them now that people would know their name well two of them at least that people would know their names straight off but I'm not going to name names because in doing so that then brings back them to lash out at me because I've got an opinion that they tell me I'm allowed to have but if I have an opinion and call them out it's like I don't know what I'm talking about and there's this other guy in New Zealand that's associated to this Morgan guy too what a loud mouth he'll call you an idiot and all these other names if you don't agree with him he'll even ask you if you know how to think I mean in some ways I mean he's he's running a, a slightly different program but he's running a program and he's also got a large audience and like um, Morgan this guy I didn't come across him until a couple of months ago and the connection between the mind control MK Ultra and the infiltration of alternative lifestyles and media even the connection didn't come through then but this Morgan guy there's a connection and if he's connected to Byron Bay and if he's done what he said he's done and I know exactly that community and I know that he's been around the same places I've been around because you know this community where I stayed at is only part of a, a larger story that I haven't even gone into and why I have known this area for years and years and years and even to a large degree how even before I went to this community these people at this community didn't know me but there were other people that knew me very well so I do know the area I know what goes on in it I and I also see that there's the shadow part of the society to it like anywhere you go you get the, the glossary you know the glossy tourist brochure that's the pretty version that you think it is the ideal that's what they want you to believe it is but everyone knows that that's not reality 
And that's kind of the same with these communities. They're, they're all glossed up to look pretty, but they're not at the heart of it. So when you look at this community at Ganyawe, and it's not just this one, I've heard it said from many, many places, and also this Morgan guy says about the corporate structure of running Australia and everything that we should not be run by companies and blah, blah, blah. And uh, yes, I'll get a little bit more into that when I explain a little bit more about what a company actually is. But I don't need to tell you that they are companies because they tell you themselves. As you can see right here at the very bottom of the Ganyawe ad, Alternative Lifestyle Community, that you get to sign an agreement as a tenant with the company. And it is a company. Now, I could tell you heaps about what goes on in these communities, but I want to try and stick to explaining a broad overview of I didn't just suddenly arrive at this community one day and not know anything and only learn what I learnt there, there and then. Uh, there's a much bigger picture that, you know, I don't want to make this a, a 10 hour video to get there. So I'm just going to chop through all that and get straight to the corporate structure of these alternative lifestyles. Now I've said previously there are hundreds of communities that are in the larger area and they all have to register an ABN because of the activities that they carry on and you can say that only registering as an ABN only makes them a business but the thing is that once you register an ABN that's a very bottom level of the corporate structure. So it is a corporate structure. The next tier up from that is taking it to a proprietary limited company. Now just as with an ABN and as a business, if your business goes under, they can take all the business assets and all and anything that you own personally to cover any debts. Now, when you take it that next tier up to the proprietary limited company, the company is the entity. So if your company goes under, only the assets of the company can be taken, not the assets of the individual, unless the individual used assets, individual assets to secure um, a loan for the company, then that could be taken. It is a proprietary limited because it has limited liability and responsibility on the people operating the corporation, the business. Now, as I said, that any activity that goes on in Australia has to have an ABN. And I'll explain why a little bit, but um, I just wanted to explain to you that the first tier of it is to register at the very bottom of the corporate structure in as a business. And then if you do not want to be held personally responsible for your activities, you then set up the structure where only they can they can only take the assets out of the business not out of your personal assets. Uh, if you haven't used any of your personal assets to run the company and your company goes under, they can't take your house, they can't take any money out of your bank account, they can't sell off any of your assets to pay the debt. Only those assets that belong to the company can they do that with. So this is a level of personal protection that the people that run a company take on so that well, if it stuffs up, I'm not going to lose everything. The person that ha only has an ABN, if their business folds, they could lose everything. So that's pretty much the difference between the two. A company can only lose what the company has, whereas a, the just the ABN can lose everything that a person has.
in a, another place I looked at yesterday, I was listening to a video that they did about buying into the property and everything. And they actually said that you would become a shareholder of the company and that what you built there, like your house or anything, would become an asset of the company or aka the community. And that sort of just raised a little bit of a red flag with me because I thought, well, if he's if this person that you want to come in and contribute money and buy into the company and then they build a house and that actually becomes an asset of the company. So if the company folded, that guy'd lose his house because it's not his house, it's an asset of the company or AKA the community. Now they can paint it up and say it's an asset of the community, but in all legal purposes, they are a company and it is an asset of theirs. And this guy clearly said it, that it remains an asset of the company. He didn't say community. Well, he did say it afterwards, as I said, AKA the community. So it is clearly a company and a corporate structure. And to allow for the buying in structure side of it too, the proprietary limited creates shares. Because when you have a proprietary limited company, you have to have at least two individuals or another proprietary limited company that takes responsibility that's behind that, that you can end up coming back to at least two individuals. So that's where your proprietary limited and your two individuals have a 50-50 share. Now in the circumstance of Ganyawe, there were originally three. So they would each have a 33.33% share in the company. Now I'll take you on to the corporate affairs search of, this is their you look up the ABN, you can see that uh, it's Ganyawe Proprietary Limited. It's a private company. Click on that, we'll go to their ATSIC record. Here we can see that they are Ganyawe. Their date of registration was the beginning of uh, 2017. I've looked at this before, I know these documents are here, so I'm going to show you. So back in, um, there was three of them, so there would have been 33.33% uh, percent shares amongst three. And there was a clearly a falling out because one of the directors, uh, Sasha's, disappeared from the scene. And so there were three of them, and it's come down to now only two running Gun Yahweh. And at the beginning of this year, this notice down the bottom here, was the cancellation and or forfeiture of shares. So they got rid of Sasha's shares. Now I'm only assuming because I'm not going to pay for a search to look at this. If someone else wanted to do that, you'd find out that these people are the people I'm saying. and but I, I'm not going to pay to prove something to myself, I already know anyway. So they've got rid of Sasha, and they've redistributed, is, as you can see in the next one above, they've redistributed the shares so that there's now two directors, and that would be um, Benjamin Smith and Daniel Smith, and their share is each 50 each. Now in July there was also a change or appointment to an office holder which means that one of those people um, may have left and someone else come in. Now you can't have, there's only two of them left I'm assuming, they're running the show, they're, they're not going to want to share the profits with other people. So they're not going to bring people in on that tier of the business. You can buy into it, the company, but they still want to just be the company. So this one here, knowing that you have to have two individuals in a company, uh, either they might have swapped one out or 
someone may have bought into it and they redistribute it so that now there's 33.33% shares amongst three. Or there may have even been two. Um, as I said, I'm not going to do a search. I'm not that curious to find out how they've split it up. Uh, so anyway, the um, if I did do a search, you'd find out that at least here in this instance in the middle there, that there would be these two individuals left. Benjamin Smith, who we all knew was Hawk, and Daniel Smith, who he we all knew as I Man Dan. We like the name. And there was Sasha that uh, has disappeared from the scene, which the redistribution of shares would have been over. These um, Benjamin and Sasha were brothers, and I Man was their cousin. And these three boys would sometimes get into raging arguments. Everyone had go for cover and sometimes they get quite violent and not the kind of environment you actually want to have kids in either so if you're thinking about going to communities and you actually do have kids mine were older teenage kids more young adults but if you've got younger kids it's not a place that you would want to take them because uh, there's things that go on there that Seriously, if you didn't have a certain level of maturity to understand their immaturity, immaturity, it'd damage you forever. Back in the 80s, I worked at this place, a place called Dun & Brad Street. I worked in Melbourne in the CDC department, which is the Commercial Collections Division. Now, I'm bringing this up because I've heard Morgan talk about, you know, check out how Australia is a corporation, just go to Dun and Bradstreet and check it out. And Morgan's not the only one I've heard talk about this. I hear it, I heard it years ago come out of all these other places. It's like, but Dun and Bradstreet is a credit reporting agency. They don't register businesses if you want to register if you want to look up businesses you don't go to Dun and Bradstreet all right you may be referred to Dun and Bradstreet to get a, re a paid report on them but you can also go, go into the uh, ATSIC office and do a search yourself and look at that company and you don't have to go through one of these reporting agencies you can do it for yourself but as I said, they are reporting agencies. So going to Dun & Bradstreet and seeing that something is on there is not proof that they are a company. They are a reporting agency and a debt collection agency. Now the part I worked in was debt collection. And there were other uh, parts that were specifically where they would go and research companies what they did, their, their corporate structure, who the uh, people behind the business were, they would really do an in-depth report on them. And that's what people paid for. And there were other people that would just go and sit in the courtrooms every day <laughs> and write down the results and come back and report on them. So they were a reporting agency and a, a debt collection agency. And in the the collection part of it, m part of my responsibility in the first job I had there was to go down and do the corporate affairs searches, which was what it was called before it became ATSIC. So I go down there and do all the physical searches. These are not searches online that we're talking about here. These are walking into a, a building where they hold the physical records and you open up a folder and you read them. And everything that is about that company is in that folder. So that's what my job was to do. Now you say, well, what if they weren't in Victoria? What if they were in Brisbane? Well, this is my job to do the ones that were in my area. There's a, a branch in every other state where they all do do that. So mine was to only do what the specific physical records were available 
and I would get ones sent through from uh, interstate to, to look up for them because we need to look at the physical records. So you'd go in there and you'd have a look at all these different corporate structures and everything. You get a really good understanding of what's going on. So that's how I know what goes on behind it and that Dun & Bradstreet are not uh, the place where you want to go to see if a company is registered. That's here. Your very first port of call is your ABNs, your Australian Business Register, and the ABN stands for an Australian business name. Now, you have a look down the left-hand side here. These numbers here, if there is a proprietary limited or a if it's not just the first rung of that corporate level and a, just an ABN number, it goes up to a proprietary limited, there will always be two digits before it. Those two digits pretty much indicate, uh, like bank codes do, where the record is held and what type of record it is. So that's a proprietary limited company and the ABN number is pretty much those last numbers there. So all of these numbers that it's brought up look like they're all ABNs, um, proprietary limited. But anyway, so um, using the gun Yahweh as the example, so as you can see here, that that part there is just the ABN number. This 12 here indicates that it's got a proprietary limited attached to it which if you go over to the corresponding record, that's the record number of it here. See, if you look up here, it will actually show what I just showed you. That's the original corporate structure where it started from. And once it goes to that next rung up, it's got those two digits before it. I wanted people to be able to understand where you do search for records. Now you're on the ATSIC site here, this is where if uh, the records held in New South Wales. Now it shows you there that you could go into the ATSIC building and actually physically search the, the physical files of that company for yourself or you can go online and pay other people that have done a report and they offer information brokers down here. I don't see Dun & Bradstreet on there, they used to be on there but um, maybe they're not as big as what they used to be considering that everything's gone digital now. But Dun & Bradstreet are merely one of those information brokers that hold this kind of information already and keep up to date with it whereby you can go there and buy that information off them rather than go to that physical office. Now if you wanted to go to, like say you're in, I'm in here in Hobart and I wanted to look at records that were physically in say New South Wales. Alright, so I'm going to go to my ATSIC bureau down here, um, building, and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to ask them to see the microfiche. Because each office produces microfiche of all those hard copy documents that are then accessible by microfiche to the other ones. Now, this was back in the 80s, mind you, and I don't know whether that's still a current system but there would still be that kind of a, a mechanism in place to to be able to go through and say well look I'm not at that particular office but if I wa was could you show me what I'd be looking at so you don't need to ever involve any of these information brokers because a lot of these information brokers will take the information that they've got and they will make up their own opinion on it and if you don't know how to, to read the information that you get in a search, that's probably of benefit to you. But if you do know how to read a search, it's probably better to go to your own ATSIC office 
and search these records yourself because um, well these information brokers is third hand inf information it's not first hand or second hand information so I haven't explained woofers yet because I didn't get into too much in the communities but I think the best way to describe woofers would be to um, just go to WolfNet and listen to this video it explains that rather well now that's the brochure what I'm going to tell you is reality I didn't know what a woofer was until I moved to New South Wales or northern New South Wales and I actually had that come up because it was stopping me from getting somewhere to live you know I wasn't a woofer I couldn't live there and it's like well what's a woofer and a woofer is pretty much someone that comes in from outside of Australia that has to work a certain amount of hours in Australia each week as required by law that the Australian government made to maintain their visa in Australia when this law was introduced they um, pretty much allocated a whole industry to woofers that is no longer jobs that are accessible to ordinary everyday Australians and also accommodation too there are a lot of places that are set up where if you're not a woofer don't bother knocking there's no one home and there's a good reason for that and when you look at the video and it sounds like such a dream and people come to Australia with that dream in mind uh, what they find is a bunch of people that are really mm, some of them might be good but a lot of them and I've heard stories from woofers themselves many a story and not many of them are very good you know I said well you know you talk telling me about the bad ones but isn't there somewhere good you've been they go well no not really and they try and think but each one is just a variation on the last one they use woofers and these alternative communities lifestyle communities uh, have got the right requirements to classify themselves to meet the requirements under the government legislation to be able to use woofers and a lot of these woofers are used in alternative lifestyle communities and when I say used I do mean used they are not um, well respected and these people are not seeing the best face of Australians when they go there and, and it really you know some of the stories I've heard it I've, I apologize I said I'm sorry you went through that experience I really wish that it wasn't what it was but it is what it is as I said there might be some that are not taking advantage of the woofers now mind you when the um, COVID lockdown came in I wondered what where are all the woofers going uh, did they go home and I went looking around to see if anyone had said anything on it and then um, I found a thing on ABC News where they'd done a story where people that couldn't get home these woofers had actually helped all the farmers and everything rebuild after the fires so the whole time that the country's been locked down these woofers have been helping farmers rebuild which I thought you know what that is a really great thing that's kind of in the spirit of what this whole thing is about what like what these people expected you know not what they got and in some of the stories I've heard what they got was criminal a large number of these communities have become predatory they are controlled by um, a, a certain limited number of individuals that because there's a corporate structure and there are people that hold the power within, within that community and they also wield that power and there's a little bit of 
ego involved in it, perhaps a lot. And that takes, I mean, some of the uh, pretty blonde European morphers that have come in, they're the ones that are especially going to tell you the stories that where they end up in situations where they're giving things they don't want to just to get out of the situation that they've found themselves in. When I'm talking predatory, I am talking very predatory. And this is all part of the darker side of it that nobody is really understanding is there or is even talking about. And I do think that it comes to this insidious fac factor of infiltration of MK Ultra elements that ultimately frustrate the efforts and I'd have to say that a certain number of the individuals in charge of these communities are either related to someone that is someone or money or something like that like even these Smith boys uh, they come from money. If uh, you looked at the property and you zoomed out, you'd see Smith's Creek Road. The reason they picked this property was because that was named after their family. You know, they, they like to toot it, you know, we're a big name, blah, blah, blah. And a few times some of his their relatives came in and yes, one of them's a lawyer and one of them's Oh, they, they all do different professional things that are helping them uh, I don't know really what they were helping them to achieve I know they were helping them to set up the corporate structure and everything to protect themselves from this property uh, is millions of dollars and you've got guys that want to purchase a property that don't have jobs and are living on the dole um, yeah, you've got to ask yourself, where's the money coming from? Well, it's an alternative lifestyle community and a large part of the alternative lifestyle community is funded by things that grow in the ground and not necessarily all things that are legal. I mean, it's, it's a cash crop. Some of the communities around the area actually have a legal license to grow it and are producing it for medicinal purposes. So yes, you've got a, a fairly big shadow industry that's going on. It's non-taxable, it's paying for things and um, yeah, that's it's just pouring down with rain outside there now. Sorry, I got a little bit distracted because I know what I encountered in this community isn't every community but it's a last large majority of them and I experienced at least three or four different ones that there are this well one was just one guy and he came in and he went through our things when we weren't there and we were paying money for somewhere where we couldn't even get hot water in the place and when I said to him, you know, I can't, can't even have a shower, How do, are you going to fix it? It's like, oh yeah, I will in a minute. He wasn't even going to rent to us because we weren't woofers. But because there were no woofers around, I think he had a bit of a bad reputation, but I hadn't heard of that. Clearly the woofers talk to each other and they steer clear of some people. And as I said, there were the odd woofer that came out to Ganyawe but never saw him again and <laughs> I know why yeah and there were some people that came out there it's like well I'm not going to see you again because you know um, everything started out well and the boys were selling the place really well to them and well one of them would be and then two of the other boys would start in on an argument and there'd be a screaming match going on inside the house and you can see this person raising their eyebrows and yeah, well, okay. I wanted peace and quiet and I wanted, you know, rational people, not not a bunch of carrying on like teenage boys full of testosterone. You know, it, it, and it does get to that really childish, masculine behaviour. 
and I noticed probably it more be, being a female just how how much it dominates the alternative lifestyle and anyway I've probably said enough about all of these things and I probably haven't said enough too I've probably missed out things so I'll do another video and try and put those things in if I've missed them but so I'm just going to add this little bit on because I forgot to say how uh, things changed back in the 80s and why I know that all these communities have to have at least the, the bottom rung of the corporate structure and ABN. So while I'm doing that, I'll just play the aerial view of Ganyawa. So back in the 80s, there were three different um, things that happened that affected things in different ways. Now, one of them was Alan Bond, and one another was the Freedom of Information Act, and another was uh, the GST. So back in the 80s, uh, if you were alive then, you would remember that Alan Bond was a household name. He bought back, or well, bought back, he, he won the America's Cup. You know, he, he did something that hadn't been achieved in so long. And so he was a hero, a national hero. And he was greeted as a hero everywhere he went. And that, that, that went on for a few years, you know, this America Cup thing. And you remember the, the secret winged kill that he was developing? Well, it wasn't the only secret he had going. And uh, a few years down the track after everything had died down and no one was really paying that much attention, they started paying attention to Alan Bond for a different reason. And uh, one that you can look up easily yourself, he um, defrauded, he ripped people off. And one of the biggest consequences of what Alan Bond did was that they changed bankruptcy laws because uh, when Alan Bond declared himself bankruptcy he had utilized um, well that there weren't provisions there for any of what is there now that he put all his assets into family members names there was nothing in his name so when he declared bankruptcy and they went to take all his personal assets to pay any debtors off, uh, creditors off. He had nothing to take. So they changed the bankruptcy laws that if you have given away uh, certain assets within a time frame, that they can reclaim those assets. So say, for example, that five years ago, a rich uh, couple gave their kids um, you know they bought them a a property as a wedding present and you know it might have might have been for tax dodge reasons because you can claim them as a tax write-off too but they bought them this wedding present and three and a half years later um, the parents go or one of the parents goes bankrupt so because of the bankruptcy laws that exist today they can go and take that house and sell it to pay off the creditors because it was money that they had and utilized within a time frame on a major asset so it, it involves major assets it doesn't involve you know little things like they're not going to ask for you know grandma's chair or something like that back it, it, these are major asset things so that changed the credit reporting industry and the legal procedures that followed only if you were um, bankrupting someone to 
to get something out of them. Uh, those really hadn't come into play. As I say, these were things that were coming into play that would affect why everyone has to have an ABN. And the freedom of information was definitely something that had started coming into play when I was still working at Dun & Brad Street, where there was a whole new level of approaching things that before you didn't have to go through. And that meant that the debt collection industry and the credit reporting industry had to modify a lot of their procedures to come in line with the Freedom of Information Act. So that was more specific to the industry though, not the actual requirements of the ABN. Now ultimately they were going to introduce the GST whether we wanted it or not and the structure to hold that and monitor every single activity had already been planned to come in as an ABN. So they introduced laws that said that uh, even non-charitable uh, places that never used to have to register any kind of thing, every kind of activity had to be registered with an ABN if you were doing anything. And technically speaking, if you were a kid sitting up a stall selling uh, ice creams outside that, you know, to the neighbourhood, you'd need an ABN so that you can uh, be monitored for that activity. Every single activity has to be registered if you're making any money out of it. They even changed it where the second-hand industry was now taxable that it wasn't enough to tax you the first time that somebody bought something, something, but you're recycling it and you're buying it for a lesser product, a lesser price and everything, but you're still recycling something. And the government says, well, you know, the person that's selling it to you is making money and we want our slice of that. So this is where every single activity is monitored. Even um, your farmers, your farmers need to have a, an ABN to sell their product. They can't sell a product if they don't have a recognised activity within the boundaries of all of these changes. Uh, your sports clubs, your churches, anywhere that conducts an activity has to have an ABN. And that's just the way that they made the law back in the 80s. And that monitors the G GST structure because um, you'll see, let me take it, here the component of the business registry is first of all, is the what your activity going to come under something that is classified for GST? Now you have to employ a certain number of people and make a certain amount of money before you are going to attract GST. A lot of people will set up under an ABN to run their own business just so they can pay their um, pay-as-you-go tax on what they're earning. So it's not like they're setting up as a company and a huge business. Because they're working for themselves, they just need the ability to be able to pay uh, income uh, wage, you know, the payroll taxes, the pay-as-you-go taxes. And if they earn enough money out of those activities to also uh, register for GST and pay it through that ABN as well. Now if you're a proprietary limited company, you're looking at tax credits. Now I, I don't know anything about these tax credits. All I know is that if you're only at this bottom rung of the corporation, you're paying GST and payroll taxes more than you are getting tax credits. And those that are getting tax credits are also getting lots and lots of perks too. 
So they've really skew-wifted around in the last hundred years out of who's actually paying all the taxes. A hundred years ago, the only people that actually paid all the taxes were those that produced an income, you know, businesses that created a product and a profit. The ordinary man was not taxed for his efforts. And now the ordinary man is taxed not only for his efforts, but on everything he does. And a lot of these companies are getting out of paying huge taxes, especially a lot of them that have moved their head office overseas and they're working under foreign tax laws and not applicable to those in Australia. That's why you hear every now and again the Australian government tries to change those tax laws so that you've got companies that are earning major profits in Australia from Australian citizens but all their profits and taxes are paid somewhere else so it, it's one of those things that has been screwing over Australia without even considering the aspects that's happening today with well, I said it many decades ago that, um, you know, there's no need to go to war when you can buy out a country. And I was saying that because I had noticed how heavy um, the ethnicity of the population had swung towards one direction. And also look uh, on the corporate side of things, knowing how much they were buying into businesses and uh, becoming a major stakeholder in Australian companies. And when, once you get to that stage, that's when it starts to get political because most of these companies that are associated with um, all these alternative lifestyle communities are small and they're anti-political. But you're looking at the other end of the spectrum where you've got all your big known companies. That's when it becomes very political because the people that own these big companies are friends with the politicians. They drink and eat at the same places, you know, they move in the same circles. So ultimately the laws over the years have swung in favor of mates. And it's not your mate, it's the politician's mate who can well afford his dinner and his expensive bottles of whatever he's drinking. And he could even afford to pay two and a half, three thousand dollars $3,000 for a lavish hotel room for the night. Now, I don't know many of you out there that would even consider paying that much. Maybe if it was somewhere that you could stay for maybe two or three weeks, yeah. But a night, that's a lot of money. And that's, that's where most of these communities are on a small scale, but in a different way they affect the mass population on a large scale. And that's why I've introduced this all this corporate structure and all this talk of corporate structure because I hear people talking about these things now I'm not claiming to be an expert I'm telling you too now that this information that I know comes from uh, back in the 80s I have not looked at the current law I have not heard of any major changes and seen any major changes occur in the way that things behave. Over the years I have used the Australian Business Register. Yes, I use it to check up on people because any activity, as I said, even your sports club, your church down the road, the shop, uh, you name it, anywhere that isn't just a person walking about doing something where they're buying something for themselves or their family. If they're doing anything, even if it's not for non-profit, any of your protest organisations, your um, environmental groups, I mean, all of these things have to have an ABN. Now, whether they do or not is, well, 
some of them if if you get caught out doing particular activities and you don't have an ABN well then there's also a law for that and there's fines and you get into trouble for it and this is purely to monitor and make sure that the Australian government doesn't miss out any single possible opportunity to screw an Australian citizen out of every last cent of tax they can probably get you on. You pay payroll tax and then goods and services tax. And oh yes, I just got my electricity bill. And of course it's after the end of the financial year, of course it's gone up, so you've got that pay rate increase that the government said, yeah, yeah, but add it on every year. It's not like you didn't pay for all this infrastructure and you need to keep increasing it. Well, how about you say that for five years you're not going to increase the price? You're not going to justify it that costs have gone up because you've done some fandangled research that means nothing. Let's just for five years put a halt on it all and give people a break just for five years. It's already got to the stage where, you know, nobody can afford electricity. You've got to take out a loan to pay your electricity bill off for a quarter. And that's tax. Every man and woman and child is so heavily taxed in Australia. We are the most taxed in the world. And we're sitting back taking it. And because of this great big stuff up that's happened ever since the beginning of the year, they're going to turn around and they're going to put that 10% up that that little Johnny Howard said, oh, it'll never, ever go up. Well, first of all, he said it would never, ever be introduced. That was the lie he backpedaled on it. Then he said it will never, ever go up. And I thought, yeah, well, we know that when a politician says never, that just means until it becomes convenient to do so. And we're at that stage where it's convenient to do so. And I heard them talk about it a few months ago and it's like, oh, you've got to be kidding. We shouldn't even be paying GST. The government do not deserve a slice of our activity. Surely there is a limit to how much they can take from people. But people allow it and they say, yes, that's okay. Oh, but, you know, we've got to pay for all of this. Um, the government are the ones that made these decisions. And the government that made this decision consists of a few individuals that put millions and millions into a certain position where now we're all in holes that how many people are going to dig themselves out of? Tell you what, the rich are still rich. They're not getting any poorer. But every other person is anyone that was sitting just comfortable, just, you know, keeping their head above water, which is 99% of the population. You're now going down to the stage where a lot of people that you've looked at and you thought, well, how do people get to that situation? And how is it that they get to that situation? You know, I wouldn't get in that situation because I would control it and I would make sure. And I can't see how they say through no fault of my own. Well, here we are. Millions of people in Australia are facing something that the Australian government has done through no fault of their own. And it's something, we're facing poverty, absolute destitute poverty. And the government is not going to suffer for it, they're going to make us suffer for it. Not that we haven't suffered enough, they're going to make us pay for it. They want us to pay for their decision. And I say no. I say hold accountable the individuals that made those decisions and hold them accountable. Take everything they've got first, then see what's left. 
Surely there must be some law out there, considering that the Australian government has to be registered as a private company, listed on the stock... Oh, no, sorry, it's a public company, listed on the stock exchange and all these other things. Oh, actually, no, I'll take that back. I'm not sure whether it's public or private. I know it's listed for shares and it has to be a company so that it can trade with other companies because it has to exist as an entity to trade with another country. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to trade with America or India or Europe. It's like, well, you have to trade with someone or something. You can't just trade with a country. That country, there's 25 and a half million people in Australia. Who, who are you trading with? So they, that's why there's a legal entity that exists as our government. So they are the shareholders, title holders of the company that is running Australia and thereby they should be held accountable and take what they have first before you start taking from the people that did not make this decision. And you've got to stop and think about that, that you did not make this decision. We're, we're grown adults. And most of us would not make such stupid decisions that radically affect so many and not take any responsibility for it whatsoever. And even if we didn't take responsibility, the bloody government would turn around and make sure we did. They would force it upon us. So why aren't we forcing responsibility upon them? And yes, I've got off subject here. I was only meaning to come back in and explain, you know, something that I'd forgotten about because um, the whole corporate and company nature of it all, control mechanisms exist no matter where you go. If you go to these alternative communities, these lifestyle places, they've got a set of rules. At Ganyawe, you could see no pets, no cats and dogs. Now, when I was there, there were, cat, there were cats and dogs there. And there were cattle there. And there were horses there. Now, the cattle were actually pretty destructive because there were too many of them grazing on the land. But that's just my opinion anyway. I don't know whether they're still there or not, not now, but they say no cats or dogs. Now, that's also common to a lot of the communities around this area too. Cats, because they um, act as predators upon the environment. The thing was, uh, where I stayed at this community, I had um, a cat, and I've still got him. He's a well-travelled cat, <laughs> Sylvester. He's black and white and fluffy. He's a gorgeous cat. But he's got chewed. He really is, yeah. Anyway, so um, they liked him there. Why? because for the first time they weren't having mice and everything chew through everything and when uh, Vess got a, a mouse one of them said to me is it a native mouse and I said I don't care if it's a native mouse if it's a mouse it's a dead mouse you know there's a reason why there's always a farm cat and these communities have completely taken away the safety mechanisms around food storage as well with the failure to have a, a farm cat. Now, I, I come from farming stock generations back here in Tasmania and um, there's always a farm cat. Every farm's got a cat and most of them are sort of half feral. Uh, you know, they're not a pet, they're the farm cat. They're only fed on scraps because their whole purpose is to keep the vermin out of the barn, to keep them out of the food storage area, to keep them out of the dairy, to keep them out of uh, the chicken shed. And because all of these environments attract mice. And when you don't have cats, you got a mice problem and you've got a food contamination problem and these are pretty big issues around these communities again these are 
as I said, I've missed out lots of little things that I could tell people about these things, but even the simple fact of there's always a reason why there's a, a, a scungy old farm cat. He's got a job to do. And if you don't have a scungy old farm cat around, I mean, he's too busy getting fat off the mice and having fun with them. They're so much easier to catch. Most cats will get bored with birds because they are often out of there too quickly. So they're not going to kill anything, you know. And I've had cats before that, well, they get cleaned up by most of the native animals out there. They don't fare well against the native animals, especially possums. I had a cat come back with a great big gash down the side just from the claw of, the, of, a, of a possum. So the threat that a cat actually offers to the environment is probably a little bit over-exaggerated by people that don't understand that. And even over the years where I haven't had a cat, I've always ended up with snakes because there are mice that get into the place. They chew their way through something and they end up in the walls. You don't know they're there, but a snake can smell them. I mean, there was a place on the Gold Coast that, um, right in suburbia, this huge bloody black snake. I couldn't believe it. I And just a minute before that, there were kids running around in that lounge room. And it had come in because I, I thought, wow, it had gone along the corner of the wall and I followed it to behind the TV and there was a small hole there and uh, it, a mice, mice had chewed through to get into the house to food and because at that stage I didn't have a cat the mice had come in and the snakes had come after the mice so not only do the mice uh, the cats keep away the mice and the health issues around in food storage and I mean, they chew through wires, they damage plumbing, and if you get rats, what they can chew through, I mean, seriously, it, it's like they've got razors for teeth. So your good old moggy cat is going to do a lot about keeping not only mice, but snakes away. And that place too, where I was at, where I didn't have a cat, I thought, all right, I'm gonna get a cat. And I didn't want to get another cat because get, having pets makes it hard to rent a place. And I thought, well, I'm just going to make it easy for myself, you know, so I don't have to worry about it. But then I stepped out the front door there and, all right, it was a harmless green tree snake. But the fact was that if I'd had a cat, that I wouldn't have seen either snake. If it was a venomous snake, I mightn't have seen the cat again, but uh, the cat I've actually still got now vest. Uh, in the places that I have lived with him in Queensland I've had snakes start to come in and I've actually seen Vess pay attention and it's like what are you looking at and um, he's looking at a, a snake and I know he's going to go over to it so the first thing I do is throw something at him so he won't because I don't want a dead cat getting bitten by a snake and uh, it happened so many times that I'd call out to him Vess and he'd stop and he'd know I was going to pick something up and the strange thing is that I am such a good shot that I would hit him every time with whatever I threw at him it was like no he can't go near it I don't want a dead cat and he'd just step back after that and let let me deal with it as best as I could with snakes that who deals with snakes but anyway I'm going to leave it at that and uh, everything else for just think about everything that I've said about the corporate structure about alternative lifestyles about people that are running a narrative within alternative lifestyles and if you're out there trying to help fellow Australians and people in Victoria uh, get rid of some kind of tyranny that's ruling over them you need to be careful about who you're bringing in because those that do have large audiences they may be reporting back to the wrong kind of people and you may find yourself in a situation that you can't prepare for one way or another the risks are real whether <laughs> whether others can see them or not
I'm putting it out there so that others, well, bye.